he's considered by some to be the greatest shortstop of all time. In 1987, the St. Louis Cardinals paid him the largest salary of any baseball player up to that date. And it's no wonder, because he is someone who can do amazing tricks and things on this field. In fact, they even called him the Wizard of Oz. Ozzie Smith ready for the flip, and we're ready to start the season. Here we go. The 40-year-old shortstop. The oldest shortstop in the history of the National League to start on a ball club and on an opening day. And Ozzie Smith is indeed the wizard, and this is the land of Oz, and what a career it has been for old number one. And so it's no surprise that Ozzie Smith in 2002 was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. What did surprise people was his acceptance speech because he compared his journey through baseball and life to the construction of a baseball. He said, protecting the cork center of this ball and reinforcing it with two distinct rubber shells for me, these two layers reflect two vital and affirming shells of my core dream. The first shell is my faith in God. With him, I have everything. Without him, I have nothing. The second shell is the faith I had in myself, which came through my mother's love and encouragement. But he goes on. He says, the second part of the construction of this baseball is the wrapping of over 200 yards of wool around the core. I refer to it as the strands of love and faith that so many other people have wrapped around me, Ozzie Smith, as a person and wrapped around my dream. I will never forget the faith my high school coach, Art Webb, had in me when I was questioning my ability and expressed thoughts of going home. Art got wind of my feelings, called me up, and sternly told me, Oz, you're not going to quit. You're going to hang in there and weather the storm. And because of that call and his faith in me, I stayed. Now, the name of Ozzie Smith will be remembered as long as there's a baseball hall of fame. But who remembers the name of Art Webb? And yet, without Art, there would be no Wizard of Oz. God has wrapped around your spirit the Holy Spirit. It's there to strengthen you, God is closer to you than you could ever imagine. But around that core, he wraps strands of love and faith to strengthen you and mentor you and guide you. Who were, are your mentors? Think about it for a moment. Who taught you the important life lessons? Who carved chiseled, sanded your character? Whose opinion matters to you this day? Who stood beside you, by you, when no one else did? Who picked you up when you fell? Who put the pieces back together? Who is your mentor, your guide, your coach? It could have been a parent, a, a spouse, a pastor, a youth leader. It could be a teacher, a co-worker, friend. See, I think one of the tragedies of today is that people say they don't have a mentor. So many people I hear in business, in schools, homemakers, seniors, teens, tell me there's nobody they look up to who can guide them and help them. There are many lonely people. They've got friends, they've got acquaintances, but they don't have that real deep person who can help them, challenge them, hold them accountable help them get through difficult situations. There's oceans of lonely people out there, and that's why I think Jesus wants every one of his followers to have a coach or a mentor. He wants every one of us to have somebody who's guiding us. And then he also wants every one of us who are his followers to coach or mentor another believer. Why? Because like Ozzy Smith, there comes that moment when you feel like you are wiped out, falling down, want to pack it in, want to go home. You feel burned out or burned up. Let me tell you about a guy, a young guy. He's, he's, he's just, uh, you know, getting by, running on fumes. 
He is promoted to be regional director of a very important, influential territory in his organization. And, and things are, are going well. I, I mean, it's growing, it's going, but the problem is he's also seeing a growth in divisions within his group as well as opposition from without attacks are coming at him. He knows that disease, division, dissension, danger are only part of the job. He's faced them before, but the problem is that now he's all alone. His direct report, his mentor, someone who's been like a father to him, is thousands of miles away, doing jail time for the second time, and this time, he's facing execution. His mentor, the Apostle Paul, his name, Timothy. In the last letter we have from Paul, he writes to Timothy, we call it Second Timothy, he writes these words. Paul writes, for this reason, I remind you to fan and to flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, Timothy, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Timothy's faith the fire that burned within him is dying down to just embers. He's afraid. He's timid. It's the year 66 A.D. Timothy is assigned to oversee the house churches that are scattered throughout the province of Asia, what today we might call westernmost Turkey. It's centered in the city of Ephesus, third largest city in the empire at the time, very important, influential city, and things are going well. The gospel is spreading. Little house churches are popping up all over the region, but at the same time, there's a lot of opposition. There's some persecution, and there's dissension and false teaching from within. It feels like, Paul even says, like everyone's deserting the faith at once. What's more, Paul is way off thousands of miles away in Rome, far from Ephesus. And he's facing a death sentence ordered by the unstable emperor Nero. Timothy realizes that it's probably very soon when he's going to have to carry on this mission, message, this mission alone, all by himself, without Paul. And he feels like the fire is just going out. He needs to have his faith stoked. And that's why over the next three weeks during this sermon series in September called Stoked, we're going to look at the life of Timothy. He's one of the great unsung heroes of the faith. We're going to learn from him, this young man, how to recapture the spark of faith, but also how to spread the flame. And that's going to set us up for understanding and looking at deeper dive into the mission of Paul and Timothy through the book of Acts in a series we called Share. Beginning October 1st, we're going to look at how they spread the gospel all over the Roman world of that day. Now, I think as, as Timothy reads this letter, his mind, I wonder, probably goes back in time to the very beginning, back when he was much younger. You see, Timothy is kind of a, well, you might say, a, a hybrid. He has a father who is Gentile, Greek, uh, we don't know his name, unfortunately. We do know the name of his mother, who is Eunice, and she happens to be Jewish. So, in a sense, he's from a mixed marriage, and probably there's people who frowned upon this marriage. Maybe even their religions forbid them to marry each other. And Eunice is not following the law that was handed down from Moses. She doesn't circumcise her son as she's supposed to do. Now, we don't know why. Maybe the, his Gentile father forbid it. Maybe she's the kind of person who just likes to break the rules. I, I bet, though, her mother, Lois, who's also Jewish, probably doesn't like the fact that her daughter is not following the customs, the practices, the religion of their heritage. Regardless, Timothy grows up as a Gentile 
in a Gentile city. The year now we're looking at is 46 to 48 AD. He's from the town of Lystra. This is the place where he was born, the place where he grows up. And I bet it would have been the place where he, he would have died and left no mark, except for what happens next. A spark came and lit his life on fire. You see, around this time, two travelers came, two Jewish travelers, they came to the city, and they healed a man everybody in town knew was handicapped from birth. And this miracle caused so much awe and wonder that the people in the area think the gods have come down to us. Zeus, Hermes have come down in human form, disguised as these two humans. And so what do they do? They start to worship these two travelers. And when the two travelers hear that these people are worshiping them, they shout, they scream, they say, wait, friends, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? We're, we're only human like you. We're bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. And then they explain that the man who was healed was healed not by them, but by a Jewish prophet named Jesus who years before died on a cross, rose from the grave, reigns in power, Power with God and wants to give salvation to every Jew and Gentile. Now, as they're explaining this to this fickle mob, suddenly the people go from praising them to persecuting them to the point where they stone one of them, Paul. Thankfully, he survived. And Paul and Barnabas, the two Jewish travelers who came to town, they leave town, but not before baptizing a few believers, among them Timothy's grandmother Lois and mother Eunice. And their house, I bet, became one of the very first churches in Lystra, in that town. Over the years, Timothy watches his grandmother and his mother change. And he, he senses in himself a change, too. He feels this passion growing within him, this fire. So much so that the people notice this about him. The people in Lystra and the neighboring town, Iconium, they notice. And when Paul comes back through town again years later, they say to him, oh, Paul, you should take this young boy, Timothy, with you to learn from you and to spread the gospel. And so Paul and Silas and Lois and Eunice and the other leaders, they lay their hands upon the teen Timothy and a fire, the fire of the Holy Spirit comes down into him and he is set on fire and God calls him and he goes. Now I want you to think for a minute what it would have been like for Timothy. He has probably never traveled more than a few miles from his village. And he will probably, possibly never see his grandmother and mother and father again. He's going off to strange lands where they have different customs and languages he doesn't understand. He doesn't know what's ahead for him, except that he knows it's probably dangerous because he saw his own neighbors try to stone Paul. So he's off into this new thing, and he doesn't know what's ahead for him. The only thing he has to hold on to is the Father, the Son, the Spirit, and Paul, his mentor. Over the years, as we'll see when we get into the next series, the, the glory, the agony that they face binds them together, places them in a strong bond so that at a certain point, Paul will say about Timothy, he's my son whom I love, he's faithful in the Lord, and he'll tell the Philippians, I have no one else like him. And yet now, Timothy has to think about the possibility of going on alone without Paul. He's feeling his faith get low. I believe every follower of Jesus is a leader. 
And that means that every disciple, every single one of us here, needs a Paul and a Timothy. I need somebody who's farther ahead on the journey with Jesus than I am. Someone I can look to, listen to, learn from. And at the same time, I need somebody else I'm helping to come along to guide, to encourage, and to challenge, hold accountable. God wants that for every one of us, for each one of us to have a Paul and each one of us to have a Timothy. Because that's what Timothy is facing. How do you do that? Well, Paul, in this first chapter of 2 Timothy, gives us a wonderful image, a picture of that. He says we need to regularly pray. You can actually turn over the back of that handout you received, grab a pen, and if you'd like, jot some of these things down, because this is how to mentor. We're watching Paul show us as he talks to Timothy. He says you need to regularly pray for people, regularly pray for people. He says this, I thank God as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. This means you say, I don't know who should be my Paul and mentor me. I don't know who should be the Timothy that I should guide. Pray. Ask God to reveal that to you. Who it is who can serve in these two places. Pray for them. And then once you like identify them, locate them, keep on praying for them. Keep on praying for them. Remember to pray. Here's the second thing. Remember the foundation, Paul says to Timothy. Remember your foundation. He writes, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, Timothy, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Parents, grandparents, you are the greatest spiritual mentors your children, your grandchildren will ever have. God calls us to pass on a foundation, a spiritual foundation of faith for the next generation. Far more important, while these things are important, it's important to have, you know, braces, it's important to have sports, it's important to have a college education, but far more important than that, without taking anything away from those things, the most important thing you can give the next generation is a spiritual foundation. Why? Because we are facing challenging times. Every age has faced challenging times. And you need a rock-solid foundation to weather the storms. It shows you how to live in this life, that foundation, and it opens the door to eternal life. There's no greater gift than that. I'm not surprised that as worship attendance in Sunday school are going down, we're seeing a rise in struggles among children and teens, navigating a very difficult and challenging world. We need to give them a sure, solid, strong foundation for the future. How do you do that? You've got to grow in your own relationship first. The most important thing you can do is grow in your own relationship with Christ because you can't give what you don't have. And the second thing is, make faith a priority in your family. That means read and pray daily. Read the Bible daily. Worship weekly. I know people have a busy weekends now. But that means if you're away, come to higher ground in the evening so you can set up and start your week on a good, solid spiritual foundation and serve frequently. I thought it was so wonderful out here in the parking lot when all different ages came together to build those Habitat for Humanity houses. I think it's going to be so wonderful when on the day of ShareFest we go and walk for water so that people in Zambia can have clean, fresh water that we take for granted. Do that together. Serve frequently together. That's a great way to pass on the faith. Number three, rekindle the fire. Occasionally the fire starts to go out. Paul says to Timothy, for this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the Spirit of God gave us, does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Timothy felt his faith fire starting to fall down to embers. Just like Ozzie Smith felt like he was ready to pack it in and needed Art Webb to call him up and get him back out there, so 
Timothy gets this letter from Paul and says, come on, you've got to stick with it, stay with it. Sometimes it's hard to challenge people. Sometimes it's hard to hold them accountable. Sometimes it's hard to tell them the truth they need to hear but don't always want to hear. Take, for example, Gordon MacDonald. When he was new in the ministry, he would meet with an elder at his church and the elder would say things to him, things that he felt sounded like criticisms of him. And every time the elder would say that stuff and it sounded like a criticism, he would start to sulk. So frequently that the elder finally reached across the table one time and he said to him, Pastor, you have a trait you have to whip. It's oversensitivity. We're not talking about you or how we feel about you. We're talking about your ministry and how we can make it better. Stop injecting your feelings into these discussions. Now, someone might react strongly to that and reject that, but Gordon MacDonald didn't. He felt the opposite. He said, the man gave me a treasure of an insight. I hear it to this day, 35 years later. Every time my wife, my friend, or my enemy begins to say something, I don't want to hear. We need to help reignite the fire in other people. We also need to review the mission. Why are we doing what we're doing? Why are we facing all these challenges? Paul says to Timothy, join me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. He says, why are we doing this? To love people. God loves people so much, he sent his son to die for them so they could have eternal life and live with him forever. That's why we're doing this. This is why we're getting this message out there. Let's not miss the mission. This is why we do it, not for ourselves, but for his purpose to share his good news. The best way you can love somebody is by sharing this good news with them. And I want to encourage you to ask someone to come with you when we do Share Fest on the 24th. Ask them to come at 10 a.m. for the worship service so that we can help them receive this wonderful good news of Jesus Christ that God loves them and wants to, to live with him forever. That's the mission. Remember that. And finally, repeat the pattern. Keep doing it. As Paul did it for Timothy, Timothy did it for others. He said, what you've heard from me, Timothy, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. You see, Paul mentored Timothy, and Timothy mentored the next generation, and it's been going on every generation down through 2,000 years down to us. Now it's our turn to pass on that message to other people, to mentor them as well. So what I'm going to ask you to do is pray. Pray for two strands around the core of your baseball. Pray for God to send you a Paul, if you don't have a mentor yet, and pray for God to send you a Timothy, someone who will, you can guide in this journey. Pray for someone to mentor you, someone to walk beside you, someone to encourage you, and for someone to learn from you. And if you are a leader in a ministry or involved in a ministry, here at Woodside, whether you are the greeting team or the worship leader or you're out and serving in mission, whatever you've got, always do it with somebody else. Mentor another person, help them, they'll help you, and possibly even take over that ministry. Why? Because mentoring prevents burnout and provides companionship and promotes a healthy church. Because you and I can be blind to our faults, and our failures and our future. We need someone to guide us. William Fry is a, a bishop, and he was mentoring a young man named John who was literally blind. At one point, William asked John, How did you lose your eyesight? It was a chemical explosion, he said, when I was 13 years old. How did you feel when that happened? Oh, I, I felt my life was over. I, I just redrew, withdrew from everything. I, I hated God. And all I did was, for six months after it happened, sit in my room alone. I'd even eat my meals in my room alone. Then one day, my dad came in. 
He said, John, winter's coming. We've got to get the storm windows up, and that's your job. Make sure you get that done before I come home. And then he left the room, closed the door. I was furious. Who does he think he is? Who does he think I am? I'm blind. I can't. I can't do that. I was so angry, I went and did it. I found my way down to the garage. I found the windows. I, I found the tools. I, I found the ladder. And I was determined to go do it just so I could show him, look, I'm blind, and now I'm probably going to fall. And then he'll have a son who's blind and paralyzed. I'll show him. And so I went around, and I put up the windows. And I did it. And later I found out there was never a moment when my father wasn't within four or five feet of me. He was always there by my side. Your father is always there by your side, and you know what he's done? He's wrapped around you, mentors, coaches, guides. Reach out to them. Grab hold of them. And let's play ball. Will you pray with me? I want you to pray right now, to start to pray right now for God to show you who can guide you and who you can guide. Lord, you never meant us to go through the challenges of life alone. Thank you for the people you put in our lives who have helped us get to where we are today. Please show us, open our eyes to see those who can really open our eyes to see you and what you want us to do. And may we be those types of caregivers, mentors, coaches for others. It's so needed. We pray this in your name, Jesus.